leadership that that employee needs to hear to open up to that coaching and learning. You know, I have a very specific style of the way I've, I communicate. Um, you know, I'm driven, I'm competitive, I want to win, um, but I also like to have some fun with what we're doing. And the listener may be more along the lines of, I need seriousness, I need strategy, be very clear, don't distract me with your personality here. And that looks like a different filter on the same conversation for all different people. I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can build that connection meeting today when we get into this webinar. And then, of course, we talk about the one-on-ones, which is part of that foundation. So hence the reason it's five behaviors, but four um, communication methods within the process. Oh, sorry, Paul, I just saw your note. Someone's waiting to be let in. Let me quickly check. Uh, bear with me, everybody. Yeah, I got a couple here. So Cody. And oh, there it is. Okay, so I've let two more people in. Thanks for the note in the chat. So we have the foundation, and then you know when I first heard this term, um, which is the the next step in the process, it's called management by wandering around. And I thought, oh my god, that's got to be fake. <laughs> that sounds pretty flimsy. So I just kind of walk around and I lead. Um, and so what I've tried to do is tighten that up and put it into the concept of coaching during the game. I'm going to speak to that, but think of Nick Nurse and the Raptors or Sheldon Keefe and the Leafs for all you Leafs fans. I'm a Habs fan. Okay. Um, they don't come into the dressing room or sit behind the bench, fold their arms and say, we're down by two, go get us a couple. It doesn't work that way. They're constantly observing behaviors and they're coaching live in the moment and it's usually aligned to the strategy they're talking about in practice before the game. So I dive a little deeper in what that piece looks like. And then how do you develop not only next in lines, promotables, but people who really just need skill development to be better at their role today outside of coaching? What does that look like? And those are personal development strategies. And then if you've done those first four steps right, you've connected, you've got the filter of how someone likes to be communicated to and coached. And then you're coaching them on a regular basis. And then every once in a while, you're observing them doing the job and you're giving feedback live in the moment to validate the behavior, correct the behavior. And then you're growing um, their skill set by giving them further learning opportunities. When it comes time to write a performance review, they're easy to write. And employees actually want to sit down and have them. So I'm going to talk about the chronological order and how they've all fit together. But again, most importantly, I want to leave you with some key behaviors as you decide to implement these today. Or if they're use, you're using them today, you may improve this process by these behaviors. Um, and then again, where to find me? It's in the chat. I'll, slow to, I'll show the slide again at the end. Okay, so for those of you who've never met be, me before, grant me three minutes to tell you about my life and why I'm doing this um, and why I think I can add value. I, I've had a life in leadership and quite frankly, I've been shitty at it at times. And I've been lucky to work for people who had the courage to you know, know they're gonna rattle my ego a little bit by pulling me aside and, and helping me change the behavior. Um, but what I've learned as I've gone from shaking fries at McDonald's as a 15 year old kid in Quebec to boardrooms as member of boards and president of companies and executive is that leadership is the common theme of where I've been successful because other people have taught me. And those who have done it really well create next in lines, but they also create business results as you implement those behaviors. So a little bit about my background. Again, I've, my first kind of jump into a management slash leadership role was when I I exchanged the fake clip-on tie as an employee at McDonald's to the real tie you had to tie up as a part-time swing manager. Um, and my sales career started at that point as well by selling apple pies with every meal I could sell. Um, and then being a sports guy, I always wanted to get into retail at Champ Sports. Um, and I got that job as a full-time uh, sales professional at Champion Sport, it was called in Quebec. 
Um, working for a guy named Andre Giroux, I sold, then I became a key holder, then an assistant manager, then a store manager, and I moved to Toronto to work for a guy named Mark McRae, and, and I worked at the uh, Athletes World flagship store in Toronto, both downstairs, for those of you familiar with the Eaton Center, and upstairs, the smaller store, 343. Um, and then I really wanted to continue to progress and get more accountability. So I got an opportunity with TELUS Mobility as an area manager, and I oversaw uh, their corporate stores in Ontario and Manitoba. From there, I got a phone call from a recruiter that said, we need a director of consumer products. And I was like, what's consumer products? And they're like, well, it's what we call re retail, and it's for a pro sports team. And I was like super excited. I remember the call. I was at Devonshire Mall in Windsor visiting one of my TELUS stores. And I said, well, who's the team? And they said, the Leafs. OK, could have been the Habs. But anyways, uh, that was my foray into Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. I was accountable for all of their retail and arena, e-commerce, their catalog program at the time, all the buying, all of the retail operations in and out of the arena. And then in that organization, always wanting to grow. Um, I was bugging my boss at the time, Bob Hunter, about getting his job one day as the general manager of the entire Air Canada Centre. And lo and behold, we decided as an organization to buy Toronto FC and enter into Major League Soccer. And I was able to open that soccer stadium in Toronto back in 2006. I was employee number one, while simultaneously being the general manager at Rico Coliseum and the senior director of what is now called Scotiabank Place uh, was Air Canada Centre at the time. From there, I moved on to vice president of sales and marketing with a company called the Printing House Canada that had 70 branches across the country. Got a call, moved on to VP sales client service and please never hold me accountable to this IT at a company called Fusion Homes. So, so new home development uh, and construction and then ultimately a president of a development company in Burlington. And then when the pandemic started, I thought, great time, let's start my own company. And that led me to today. So that is 30 years of history in three minutes. Um, I now own my own coaching company where I do strategic planning, sales training, leadership training, fractional executive services where organizations hire me that are small, that, that can't afford a VP of sales, but they use me six hours a month as an example. So I, I do a little bit of everything. And then I wrote a book called The 50-Year-Old Millennial. And this is why I'm doing the free webinars and, and I do this today is these five steps that I'm gonna talk to are not happening in organizations across Canada. And I have seen them work in this entire career path. I have taken a little piece from everywhere and every different leader and I've said, okay, now how do I put something in place that people can take, have all the coaching forms, but most importantly, the behaviors to create great places, sorry, great places to work that create business results so organizations can scale and grow. And I know it sounds bold. I believe if more leaders lead this way, we can absolutely change mental health in this country, especially in our workplace. So I wrote that book to get that all out there. And again, that's the high level that I'm going to give you today. Before I do that, for those of you who have not heard of John Maxwell's five levels of leadership, um, you need to. So I'm going to start with this video, and I'm not sure how great the sound's going to be. So I'm going to put the mic nice and close. Paul, this is the point where I'd love for you to unmute and, and let me know if you can hear it when I press play. Follow you because they have to. In other words, could you hear that? Yes. Okay, here we go. At level number one, this is where we all start. We all start with a title. We all start with a job description. We all start with a position. People at level number one follow you because they have to. In other words, you're the boss. The downside of level number one is the people who follow you will give you the least amount of their energy and effort. People don't like to have to follow people because they have to follow people. Level number two is the permission level. People now begin to follow you because they want to. Now, what happened between levels one and two? You've connected with your people. They're not following you just because you are a supervisor. They're, they're following you because you are a supervisor that people like. The leader on level two, they have three things that they do extremely well to be a relational leader. One is they listen well. Secondly, they observe. They're conscious about where their people are. Oh, my apologies. Are and what their people are doing. And thirdly, they're learning. And then in the process of listening, observing, and learning, they have an attitude of servanthood. The third level 
It's the production level. At, at, at this level, you become effective as a leader because you produce. And at level number three, your leadership begins to gain credibility because now you are fleshing out for the people around you things that they want to see. Level number four is the people development level. The most appreciable asset you have in any organization is the people of that organization. Three thoughts on developing people. Number one is the key to developing leaders. and The key to developing good people is in recruitment. 80% of your success of equipping people to be successful is in the front door on who you bring in. Recruitment is key. Number two is positioning. The ability not only to bring the right person in the right in, in, the, in the front door, but also put them in the right place, as Collins would say, get them on the bus, get them on the right seat. Successful people have discovered what they're good at. Successful leaders discover what other people are good at. At level number four, you recruit well, you position well, and then you equip well. And I use a very simple five-step equipping process. The first step is, is I do it. Step two is I do it and you're with me. I take you with me. Now we're going to spend time together. I'm going to be your mentor. Now on step three, you do it. You do it and I'm with you. Step four is you do it. You don't need me anymore. You know how to do it. You do it and you do it well. Step five is, is you do it and somebody's with you. You've never really trained and equipped somebody until they can multiply themselves. That's level number four. It's the level where you develop people. It's level number five, the pinnacle level. The pinnacle level, the key word there is respect. They follow you because of who you are the qualities you have in your life. They follow you because of what you have done. Leadership is an always ongoing, always learning, growing process. Okay. So what I'd ask you to do, no one needs to know. You don't need to submit anything. If you got a pen and paper down, based on what you heard out of that video, and there will be no tests, so don't worry, what level do you think you're on? You think you're a level one leader? You think you're a level two leader? Do you think you're a level three leader? Do you think you're a level four people development leader? Or you think you're a level five, people follow you because of your leadership reputation and what you can do? What I'd ask you to do is write that down now. And then when I'm done sharing these five critical steps in the process and some of the high level behaviors, I'm gonna ask you if you think you implemented all of those, what your number would be then if you're not doing them today. So full transparency, that's why I'd like you to, to write down your number. And again, you won't have to share your number, okay? But I just want your thought process. So let's talk about, um, and what I'd like to do, it's 12.22. So I wanna spend about four to five minutes on each of these, give you a high level, and then I'll open it up to some questions. So for those of you who are coaching employees today, if you have not had a connection meeting, it is never too late. If you bring in a new employee today before you ever start to coach them, if you want to be more successful with those coaching sessions and you want people to open up so they trust you so you can help and change behavior, start with one connection meeting. That's it. You only have to do it once. It's ideal when someone starts and then revisit them every year or two if you can. But here's what I want. This is why the connection meetings are so important. So let's say... I'm your coach, I'm your manager, I'm your director, I'm your vice president, your president. And you start with me and about three weeks in, I sit you down, we have a coaching session, we go through your key performance indicators. I talk to you about the things on the go. You talk to me about what you're working on and we wrap it all up and I say, see you next week. Depending on your level of trust with me, I've got a ton of knowledge to help you. I can give you learning tips, resources, job shadowing. If you don't trust me and you think all I want to hear as a leader is yes, I won't open up. That's the leader's fault. It's not the individual who won't open up. We haven't created that space. So the connection meeting, I'm gonna age myself here, um, allows you to open up an emotional bank account. Okay, when, when I was a young buck, Remember, my book is called The 50-Year-Old Millennial, so that'll tell you something. And I started with tragically hip music to start this because my arthritis is killing, but I digress. Um, when I was a young buck, I went to the bank and I had this thing called a bank book. And like I walked in and I couldn't get that bank book unless I put money in my account and they would open an account. 
And every time I would go in to either take money out or put money in, they'd take this hardcover bank book and they'd stick it in a machine and they'd give it back to me. And, and then I had my track record in my bank book of where things were at. The desired state was to put in a lot of money on the front end so I could take some withdrawals and not go into bankruptcy because when I was 19 years old, no one gave you a line of credit. When you had no money, you had no money. So think about that from a leadership perspective about being your emotional bank account. And your connection meeting is your first deposit. And this is where you are finding all about your new employee very strategically on what communication looks like to them, what recognition looks like to them, how they take constructive criticism, I call them area of opportunity, and what a good leader looks like and what a bad leader looks like. And the reason that's important, I wanna do more of your good leader than I wanna go back to your bad leader that made you quit your last job. And unless I know that journey coming in, it's a risk. And the less trust I build in that bank account, the more um, risk adverse you're gonna be. And when I take out a withdrawal, cause one day I have to say, hey, you had a bad week, you didn't hit your numbers, let's talk about that. If there's no trust built, now you're getting closer and closer to bankruptcy. But if I lead you in the way you want to be led and I have the communication style that you need and I recognize you in the context of what you view recognition being and I give you areas of opportunity in the manner that you want to hear it, that feedback doesn't hurt so bad and it's more viewed as a learning opportunity. So think about the emotional bank account. So I normally start with, again, I'm giving you an eight hour training here, dang, in like one hour, so bear with me. But good news is it's free. Um, know their journey, acknowledge it. So in a connection meeting, I'd say, you know, what are you most proud of in your career and what caused those results? So now I know what skill to leverage moving forward and I know what type of challenges they like. And I know what they deem as high value and I wanna make sure I don't miss that as a leader. It also gives them credibility when they're coming in. What we try and do with a new boss is we always seem to be trying to prove ourselves because they, we want you to know we matter will give them that storytelling as they enter the job and build that credibility in the connection meeting. Find out what a good leader looks like and what a bad leader looks like to them. And again, go towards the good. Like, you know what I loved about my leader is they weren't a micromanager, but we sat down once a month and we talked about the numbers. And if I was doing well, they told me why. And if I wasn't, they gave me some ideas on how to change the result. That, that looked like good leadership to me. Oh, a bad leader looked like I never heard from them for six months. And then I got my performance review. And so you'll get what they liked and didn't like from leadership, and you can gravitate and repel from the other. Um, acknowledge the now and recognize the value of the role and how you can support. So people will tell you what you want to hear in a uh, interview. The reality when they get in the role is when it hits home. So talk about the role, but do it from the perspective of asking them open-ended questions. What do you think I'm gonna be holding you accountable to? What do you think success looks like in this role? What do you think the day-to-day -day is? And if they get it right, validate that. Hey, that's exactly the behavior I need. That's exactly what's going to set you up for success. And where there's gaps, identify them too. Well, you know what? The one thing you didn't mention was your sales targets. But you're in a sales role. So one of the things we measure is average sales here. I don't want to tell you what average sales is. And clarify that in the connection meeting so they're open to co a coaching and have context moving forward. Find out where they want to go next, just at a high level, if they've got any ideas that they want to grow or what they want to learn. So you can have that and use that in your one-on-ones and learning opportunities and your professional development strategies down the road, which we're going to talk about. Here's a really important one that we don't ask. And when we do, we're worried that we get too personal. But what you need to figure out is what does work-life balance look like to them? And I'm always looking for sacred cows. And you'll see here that I talk about the running story. So I was at a company called Fusion Homes for about six years in Guelph. And I was the vice president in the sales. And then I got promoted to IT, which again, I think it's because no one else wanted to do it. And then I got uh, client service. So now I have three teams in the department. And one of the ladies that I was um, supporting in client service, who was the director, had been around forever. And, and so I'd been working with her for six years. So I'm like, geez, I think I know everything about her. Um, 
but why don't I still do the connection meeting and, and, and do this exercise? And so we sat down and we talked and I said, now, I know you're big into running. Um, what are you training for? And she said, well, I'm training for Boston. Oh boy, okay, so you must be pretty intense right now. She goes, yeah. I said, so, you know, what does that look like? What's the time commitment? Well, you know, I run this, this many kilometers these days and Thursday night's my running group. Oh, what time's that at? Is it 5.30? Wait a second. I've kept you here till six o'clock the last three Thursdays. Yeah, I know. I'm like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. That to me is a sacred cow for you. So I've got, I can't step on that. Like, oh my God, I'm glad I asked. Are you okay? That if I see you at your desk at 5.05 on Thursdays, I kick you the heck out of here and get you to your running group. And if I do need you on a Thursday, for whatever reason, I will let you know in advance so you can coordinate. Those are the types of things that come out of a connection meeting. For me, it's pizza nights. Friday night is the night my wife and I and the kids make homemade pizza. And if you keep me at work till six on a Friday, I'll never tell you because you're my boss. But boy, that could be one of the things that's aggravating me that may be leading me out the door. And if you get the connection early, now think of when we get to the one-on-one -on -one and, and now you've recognized that as a leader and you open up and you tell me, are you gonna support it? Now, when you need me to do something in the coaching session, I got your back. And now when you ask me, hey, what's going on? How can I help? I'm gonna open up more. So the connection meeting is key in setting that environment. Get personal. Don't be shy to share who you are and what you're about um, and find out how people want recognition and how they want area of opportunity, constructive criticism. And that looks like I have seen leaders, I have been that leader, seen leaders. I have been that leader where, because I like a good bottle of wine, nice IPA, I've had a team member do a great job and I've given them an LCBO card and they were an alcoholic and they were in AA. You talk about a fail as a leader. And they didn't tell me. I didn't know. And I found out from someone else who they were close with at work, and they told me. And I felt terrible. Now, I wouldn't go probing in the connection meeting to find out if they're in AA. What I would have gone probing for is when you do a job that is above and beyond. I'm not talking about showing up for work on Monday here. I'm talking about crushing your budget by double digits because of the behaviors you put in place. How do I recognize you? Oh, I'm a, I'm a lease fan. You got to know, Mark, I know you tease about the haves, but I've been a lease fan my entire life. Good to know. Now, if they create a million dollar increase for the company, I was going to say, what's a hundred dollar leaf ticket? That doesn't exist. But what's a $300 leaf ticket as an example and sending them out to dinner and recognizing that now that's personalized and it reinforces the connection and it builds more trust versus giving them a gift certificate to the mall. Anyways, Sidebar, probably too much time on the connection meeting. Now, when I do this training, you're going to feel me rushing through it. I go into detail. We do exercises. I give you the connection meeting form so you can actually prepare for the meeting. But these are all the behaviors that I'm trying to share in this free one-hour webinar. Next, the anchor of any good servant leadership program is your weekly one-on-ones. And I know for some organizations, it can't be done weekly. They're bi-weekly. And in some of the organizations I've trained, they're monthly. As long as they're done well, they add a ton of value. So we already talked about the connection meeting, assuming it's done. You need to shift from direction in your one-on-ones to guidance and support. Let the employee take ownership of the direction and you validate that they're going the right way. And I'll share a little bit more on that. But if I were to tell you that you want to get better at one skill in life, and this is going to sound ironic because I'm talking into a microphone with everybody muted, so I'm clearly advocating here. Um, become really good at the balance of inquiry versus advocacy. And inquiry is your ability to inquire, ask questions, find out more, and then you advocate how you can help with that. Or you advocate why those behaviors are right. Um, think of the 80-20 rule. You should be asking questions at least 80% of the time and 20% of the time you should be advocating a solution. Um, do that in the context of the goal that you're trying to serve, which is what was last week like? If I would have been there, how could I have helped, right? So you can coach the past even without being there by asking the right open-ended questions. If I was sitting at your desk last week, where would you have needed my help and why? Or if I was sitting at your desk, what would I have seen that was like out of this ballpark and why did you create that result? And you wanna do the same thing moving forward to say, okay, you got the upcoming week. Tell me where your priorities are. 
What are you worried about? What are you not worried about? How are you feeling about the workload? A lot of open-ended questions so then I can advocate. Hey, listen, you said priority was getting um, the sales budget done this week. You wanted to do 110% of your goal. I hear that, but you do know you got that visual merchandising change that needs to be done Monday at nine. So I'd make that priority number one. How are you feeling about that? And if you don't inquire, you can't advocate. And what you ideally want to get to when you get so good at this skill is you want to validate, not advocate. So the employee would say, oh, Mark, you know what? I'm glad you asked me about that. Maybe I need to like look at my calendar and, and make sure I've got organized for visual merchandising Monday morning and get it out of the way so I can hit that sales goal. So I think I'm going to reverse those. Hey, you know what? I got to agree with you. Great call. Go ahead. And so inquiry versus advocacy is important in coaching. It is critical in sales and the art of paraphrasing back what you heard. It's also pretty important in life, says the divorce guy who's remarried. But uh, the better you get in relationships at asking questions and versus always talking about your position, the closer the relationship will become. Okay. Think of the one-on-one -on -one, every time you write one as your roadmap to the performance review. And what I mean by that, you know, in, in my one-on-ones, I have five boxes and there's a middle box that's called recognition area of opportunity. And that box is specific to performance review time. Those are the things when I write my year-end review that I don't want to forget happened in February when I'm writing a review in November. I recognize and coach through the four other sections, which are what happened last week. Let's review your KPIs. What do you have on the go? Here's what I need from you. What do you need from me? And all those coaching opportunities are there, but I keep a box that's specific for performance reviews. Clearly I don't fill them every week because not everything is, whoa, above the bar. This needs to get into your performance review. I'm not gonna write in there, thanks for coming to work every day. That is not something that I'm going to recognize at performance review in a high performance culture, but I will put in there, what a tremendous quarter in sales. You brought in your team for some sales coaching on a Friday night pizza party. You took everybody through the training behaviors and your store accomplished a goal of 117%. That would get in there. So when I write the review in November, I don't forget it. And it's the full circle of trust with your employee that will help you recognize them but also open them up to the feedback they need to succeed. So again, I have that little box in the middle of it. The other thing I tell you in one-on-ones and, and any other communication stream is, is look for nonverbal clues. And if any of you have been through leadership training or sales training, you may have seen this model before. 93% of what you understand in the message isn't the words. 7% of the message you're bringing in resonates because of the words. The rest is my body language. So if I'm coaching someone, I'm saying, how do you feel about next week? I'm good. Okay. What's your number one priority? Sales. Yeah. And how do you feel you're going to do this week? What can I do to help you? No, I'm, I'm good. There's a nonverbal clue that they're not. And you want to inquire and open up the dialogue. And if you're not looking for the nonverbal clues, you lose the opportunity as a coach to help them succeed and build further trust. Always look behind and forward. I mentioned that earlier. So you can coach something that happened five days ago by asking the right questions and building an environment where someone wants to say, yeah, actually, I didn't get that proposal in time. Um, I was a day late. If you were with me, I might have asked for your help on the corporate profile section. I had to go search for it. I had to ask a bunch of people. I couldn't get an answer. I wasn't well prepared. How do I do that better next time? If I don't ask the question about last week and I wasn't there, I've lost the coaching opportunity. And if I've got no connection and no trust, my employee isn't going to be proactively bringing it up. We both lose. Finally, in one-on-ones, always a, an opportunity for open forum. And this is where you learn a lot about the company, the employee, and you say, hey, this is your time. Is there anything you want to talk about? Um, and I can put the pen away, and this can stay between you and I. Um, but if you want me to be accountable for following up on something you want to talk about today? Can I put the pen in my hand and write down and hold myself accountable? So my one-on-ones look like, hey, how you doing? How was the week? Let's talk about last week. KPIs in there, if they are behaviors that drove the KPIs. Let's talk about next week. Any of the middle box stuff for performance review. Okay, what do you need from me for next week? And then here's what I need from you for next week all in the concept of inquiry versus advocacy and paraphrasing back 
so we know we're on the same page. That's how you run a great coaching session. Um, and again, if this stuff interests you, go get the forms online. They're available in the training and the link that I share. Okay, moving on. So we've talked about the connection meeting. We've talked about the one-on-one. -on -one. The third anchor in my five servant leadership anchors, again, that are in the training and in that book is coaching during the game. I always tell this story and it seems to hit home. You know, Nick Nurse, when we won the championship against Golden State and we were down by two, didn't call a timeout and said, look at the scoreboard, everybody. We're down by two. We need a three. Go. He pulls guys aside with his assistant coaching staff and he's saying, guys, we can't get an open three because we're not setting the screen. And we're not setting the screen on time because we're not moving our feet. And when we do get there, we're not squaring up. So remember those behaviors we worked on practice. Get to the top. Get the open guy to take the shot out to the elbow, pull back to the three, hold them up and roll. Wide shoulders, quick feet. But we don't coach our business that way. We don't, we don't watch the game. We say, you had a bad week. You missed your numbers by 10%. Next week, you better catch up that loss. But the best role models we have for coaching are right in front of us in sports. And they always coach on behaviors. And their best time for coaching is in, in practice where they're practicing the behavior, it's observing it happening. So here's what I, I try and share with people. And again, in a form, process-baked, um, go to a site. If you're a, store, a regional manager, if you're a district manager, a VP, if you're in retail, if you're a store manager, get on the floor. Um, if you're a sales and marketing executive, sit in on a campaign. If you're a CFO in finance, Sit in on month and budget statements with your account reps across the organization and observe people doing the work, but prepare. What is the behavior you want to look for and recognize or coach live and in the moment? Look for them doing it right. People repeat behaviors when they're recognized for behaviors. So find them doing things right that you want to see them repeat and then coach on anything that's deficient. They're also a great agent and a platform for change management and buy-in. Let me explain what that means. When I was overseeing sales at uh, Fusion Homes, this company in Guelph, we had multiple sales centers in London, Waterloo, um, Guelph, Kitchener, et cetera. And when I go out and sit on a Saturday morning and we were really working on driving upgrade sales. So, you know, you buy a house, you get a base model, and now we want to move you from carpet to hardwood, as an example, or from laminate to quartz or granite. Well, as I was observing this and watching their sales behavior as the coach, I saw a process gap. And so when I was watching them sell, they were saying to customers, we can finish your basement. It's about $37,000. And nine out of 10 customers, their eyes went like this, and they went, I can do it on my own at Home Depot for 10 or 50, right? And they didn't know how to overcome the objection. So I saw the coaching opportunity to say, okay, but with us, they can roll the upgrades into their mortgage. They already told you they're gonna flip that home in five years. So they're not gonna pay that full amount, but they're gonna get the full return on their investment when they sell the house for those upgrades. And they're gonna spend $137 a month additional in their mortgage. It's a win for them. Behavior change from going in as a coach to help them with that result. Process change. You know, tell me what would help with that. Well, you know, people keep mark, they have to keep track, like, okay, that, that works for hardwood, but now what do I do when I tell them for their countertops? Um, well, what would help? And he goes, well, you know, Mark, at the banks, when, when you see the banks, when you pop in the price of the home and the interest rate, it shows you your monthly payment. Like, imagine if we could do that with upgrades. Boom, senior leader takes it away, goes to work with my IT team and says, here's what I need you guys to build. They build it, it goes back to our selection program. Customer says, I'd like to look at, what's the cost difference between granite and quartz? Steady square feet, oh, it's an additional X per month. That's on my mortgage, yeah, we can manage that, boom. And off you go. If you're not coaching during the game, you can't improve behaviors, you can't improve process. And for me, as I'm doing one-on-ones with multiple people as a senior leader at the time, everybody's got a different hot button issue. And so how do you react? Well, when I've got eight people telling me, here's the problem, now I can react and I can validate it when I coach during the game and I'm on site. Professional development strategies, full kudos to TELUS Mobility, change my life as a leader. Oh boy, 
probably 15, 20 years ago now, I'm really aging myself, but every employee, including part-time members in the kiosk had a personal development strategy. So they saw that employee retention came from engagement. Most organizations, if they do a development strategy, they're only doing it for promotables, not for everybody. But a part-time may like their job and just want to learn something. Maybe they don't know how inventory works, or maybe they've never been on the sales floor, or maybe they want a little more product knowledge. Whatever those things may be, those things are in your development program. If you're a municipal employee, maybe you have someone who is accountable for, um, I don't know, site plan approval with developers. Now I'm making something up out of my past. I was the president of a home building company, but I'm not a land guy, but I was accountable to it. But they may not understand all the touch points across the rest of the city, but they want to learn. So how do you expose them to some mentoring with other people? Or how do they say, I want to better service the builder? Okay, we've got some builders that maybe you can go and sit with them and understand their process and survey them and find out what they want from an approvals process. Those learning opportunities are all around us. And we keep getting tricked into thinking people stay at companies because we give them free drinks and slides. F no, F no, right? People stay at companies because they think they have an impact and what they're doing matters and they're growing and learning as they do it. So professional development strategies are tremendous for retention as well as promotables. So high level, gotta be there for at least 90 days before I even start to talk about a professional development strategy, you gotta get through your probation. And you gotta be hitting the expectations in the role. If not, I'm just gonna focus on our weekly coaching till you can do the day job well before I give you new learning. Personal, it's their plan. Let them drive their growth. You're a resource. So in my PDS forms, I sit there and say, okay, what are your short-term goals, your long-term goals? I really like to be a manager. Okay, what do you think a manager does? Oh, well, I know they coach because you coach me, Mark. Yeah, um, what else? Well, have you ever done budgeting? No. Have you ever done strategic planning? Because you got to do it for the department. No. Okay, good. We've got some learning opportunities. Would you like to learn those? Great. How much time do you want to invest? And now it's their plan and they're owning those gaps. You're just guiding them. You're helping them give the knowledge or the resource to close those gaps. If they don't do it, they don't do it. If they do do it, great. They're learning and they're probably going to succeed in the organization. But most importantly, they're going to be engaged. Most of us do want to learn and add more value to our skill set. Again, no accountability. So professional development strategies don't show up on a performance review. Don't hold me accountable that I didn't go learn a little bit more about marketing today when I'm accountable for the sales result for my region. Those are two separate things. That's what I'm getting paid for today. So don't hold me accountable to my learning cycle over here. Um, I normally do them quarterly and then we report and review and change it and update it, et cetera. So people are constantly getting fresh learning opportunities but they also know that I'm recognizing that they got another feather in their cap, and that's important for individuals. How do you do that? Job shadows, mentoring, cross-functional opportunities, getting them books, sending them to courses, all those things are great learning opportunities for your team. Okay, performance reviews, and then I'm going to open it up to questions here. I'll give you about 10 minutes if anyone has any. Ideally, if you're an organization, you want to do them twice a year. One can be a verbal and one can be a written. And again, your one-on-ones, you should have this folder of your regular one-on-ones that we talked about earlier. You should have connection, so people are gonna trust your performance review. You should have live observations. Your performance review should be fantastically easy to write and high value. What I recommend as you do these is when you're writing them, make sure you have specific behavior-based statements. So don't just say, you hit 117% of your sales goal, or marketing drove a 32% increase to web traffic. Write how they did that. You hit 117% of your sales goal for your store because of your training, because of your product knowledge night, because of your one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions, and define the behaviors. Two reasons reiterates trust for next year. You're paying attention as a leader. You get how I'm being successful. Two, you're also telling me what I need to repeat, period. Right? You get me. And the only thing worse than not telling someone they've done a good job is telling someone, good job. 
People know you don't know. You're just looking at the numbers. People want to be validated for the effort they put in place that caused the result. Always write a value added statement. And if you can do it in a manner that says, here's why it's good for you. Here's why it's good for the customer. Here's why it's good for the company. That will get you repeat behavior. So, hey, your sales result at 117%. Congratulations. That increased your earnings by 117% because you're on commission. So fantastic year for you financially. Got to tell you as a company, your 17% so your 117% wasn't budgeted for. So we've got additional revenue now that we can reinvest in new land and buy new lots. So thank you for that. And at the end of the day, your customer service says people trust you, they're coming back, they're buying more, you're getting referrals. That 117% is allowing you to impact more of our customers. So thank you. Value statements of why the behaviors drove the numbers. So that is the type of performance review that people wanna hear. And you get to do it on the flip side. If someone's struggling, same thing. What's the result? What are the deficient behaviors? And why should they change that behavior? What's the value? Again, you've got all the backup from your 101s, so there should be no arguments. I would tell you the self-evaluation trap. If your organization is doing this today, it's okay, but don't get caught in it. I think most people probably have had this happen to them. Gonna do your performance review in November. So fill out your self-evaluation and send it to me by October 1st. And then the manager goes, okay, they got most of it. I'll add a couple words in here and my performance review is done. And your team can see right through it. There's no effort there. So here's what I do with self-evaluations. If your organization does do them today, have them put them in a brown envelope and have them bring them to the performance review, not share with you. You write your review based on all these behaviors that I showed you and all these great things that you're doing. Have the employee read their self-evaluation live and in the moment, you read yours. Yours is obviously king because you're the person holding them accountable, but they may bring up something you forgot and you can add it, or the two of you could say, wow, we're on the same page, great, nothing to discuss, or you could say, boy, you think you did this well, I didn't see it, here's why, and you can identify the deficient behavior that the other individual thinks they're doing well at. But do not copy and paste the self-evaluation, you'll garbage in, garbage out. Okay, that was eight hours and 51 minutes. Um, obviously, I do deep dive in all of this. So again, if you are an individual and you wanna learn more, my course is on Udemy, 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 anyways. Um, and I go through all five steps. I have an hour video for each step and I have the coaching log that you can download in perpetuity. Once you get that course, it's yours uh, and you get a certificate when you're done. If you're a corporate leader and you wanna learn a little bit more, uh, my corporate website is up. Uh, my rate at 4.45 an hour sounds like, wow. Um, but you can put 24 people in a room. So you can actually Card 445 and 24, and that's your hourly rate for each employee going through this training or manager. I do them virtually or live. And then lastly, if you just want to learn a little more, I, I wrote this book and it's on Amazon and you can dive deeper into these things. And in that book, it's a little more fun. It's a little bit more about my past. Um, it's a little bit more about stories on how we did this and where I learned it from people. And then I leave you with a little checklist at the end of each chapter. So we call it a manual and a manifesto. Having said all of that, it's Q&A time. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And if anyone would like to ask any questions in the chat or unmute now and open up your camera, I'd be happy to take some questions. Or are you all just still feverishly writing notes? Cause you're all still here. So that's a good sign. Hey, Mark, it's, it's Paul. Hey, Paul. Oh, I think I just muted you, Paul. Yeah, please come on and ask a question and then I muted you. Sorry about that. No, great presentation. I think you know, everything you said you know, really re relates back to what we do in the retail level from, from top to bottom, and, and you know, whether you're a store manager to a, an associate. Uh, but just transitioning from you know, your, your past of, of being in the corporate world to, to kind of running your own business, you know, maybe what, what are some of the successes and challenges that you had to, to, to transition from? 
why don't we start with my failures? Because there's a lot of those as an entrepreneur that I, that I think would even add more value and, and certainly I'll ask a question. Um, the more senior you get, the less functional you become. Um, and I'm learning that the hard way as an entrepreneur. So silly thing like, hey, I, I had a VP of finance who reported into me into the, the home building company that stayed on top of our investments and the investors and, and the monthly P&L and the results and fed me the information. Try doing your own books as an entrepreneur <laughs> and having a balance sheet on your own and keeping every invoice and then breaking out your HST paid and submitting it for taxes. So the reason I share that is that's been the biggest learning curve for me is I've had to dive back down into my functional skills around sales and marketing just to get people to pay attention to my sales and marketing training. Um, so that's been the biggest thing. The other thing, Paul, um, perseverance. If I don't know, if I, I shouldn't speak for all entrepreneurs, but I, but I don't know how authentic people are being if they don't tell you every once in a while you get into this zone where you're like, why am I doing this? Like, it's not going to work. And then a big client comes along and engages you for a big contract and you get to go and train and you see the impact it has on the people and you're excited again. But I tell you, the biggest thing I've had to learn is dive down functional and continue to believe in myself. Those have been kind of the, the two things. So thanks for the question. I got a question from B119. What are your top three most important questions to ask new staff when building a connection? Also, what are your top three most important actions or things to note during your coaching and touch bases with your team? Okay, great question. So um, top three to ask it a question, but that number one is what does a bad leader look like? And what does a good leader look like? And I keep notes. So that, that is absolutely number one. Andrew, I see your hand. I'm gonna to come to you next. Thanks, man. Um, Number two in that connection meeting, what are your sacred cows? The thing we sometimes do as leader is we piss people off inadvertently. We got good hearts, we don't want to, we're blind. And if we don't have someone who's willing to say, whoa, that's not okay, this is important to me, we lose that and we keep aggravating. We keep like poking that, right? And so that's number two. So number one, leader, number two, um, sacred cow. And then number three, the role. Like, don't assume because someone interviewed and we explained what the role is that they had the context on day one in the job. They're coming in with the filter of, I want to win the work. I want to be ready. I need this job. I want to be successful. I like this company. And they're talking about their past behaviorally in most interviews, right? Their situational behavior questions. They're not thinking about the future in the role. So I take that opportunity in the connection meeting to be crystal clear about what those expectations are. Um, B119, the second part was most important actions or things to note during your coaching. <laughs> Number one is those nonverbal clues. People will tell you what you want to hear as a leader, even if you're trying to be as open as possible. So I look and I ask if someone's, if I say, how are you feeling about this week? And they say, I feel good. I'm going to get everything done. I say, well, why do you feel that way? And why do you feel so confident? and get a little bit of a deeper dive. So I'm always probing to make sure we're aligned. That's number one, I keep real um, attention to asking that. And then in my notes, I mark down what they're saying so I can advocate um, the solution to that issue. Number two, um, important action, paraphrasing. If you're in the sales world today, if you have a boss, if you have a spouse, paraphrase back what you heard. So that just means repeating back. And that makes sure you're on the same page. So Mark, if I heard you right, you really want me to focus on the sales numbers this week and I've got to do it within the constraints of payroll. Yep, that's exactly what you heard me say. And that creates alignment. But if I'm paraphrasing with an employee and they say, yeah, yeah, you, uh, well, what I heard from you, Mark, is like, I said, I got to get the sales, I got to get budget. Oh, and I, and I got to get the administration forms done by Friday. No, actually, I didn't, I didn't say that. You can do the administration forms next week. I really want number one and number two. So paraphrase back. It builds confidence for the listener and it creates clarity. And from a sales perspective, you know, my sales training is a separate thing, but I always do a lot of research and investigate a prospect before I reach out. And then I ask a lot of questions and then I paraphrase back what they told me. So when I position how I can help, I'm just servicing their need. And we're reiterating that. So paraphrasing is number two. And the number three most important action, it's going to sound silly, 
don't be a dick. <laughs> like, be approachable. Well, why do we have to have these faces as senior leaders that command? We're, it's not who we want to talk to as human beings. You know, I wrote a blog on LinkedIn and I called it the world's shortest, most valuable blog on LinkedIn. And it was like five words. Be approachable. You're welcome or something like that. Four words. And that was the entire blog. People can read that energy. So be approachable. Andrew, your hands up, my friend. I don't know if that's accidental or on purpose. Oh, it, it was on purpose. Oh, boy. I was just trying to unmute myself and put on video. Um, I want to thank you for this. It's been uh, very beneficial. Um, sometimes it's good to hear it put in words. You know, you do some of it or you've done some of it in the past, but then you just need a refresher now and again just to put things into perspective. We're, we're retail, so day in, day out can be very similar day to day. So uh, thank you for this. It, it's been very helpful. A um, question for you is pretty basic. Who was your favorite leader or manager and what made them so? Oh, well, I have, I have two answers to that question. So I'll give you, I'll give you both. Um, personally, and you sucker me into it, you don't even know, we're going to get emotional. Mom and dad. Sorry, I've lost them both. Um, I think I'm so passionate about this leadership process because my mom was your maritime or life of the party, put everybody at ease. Everybody eats first, then I'll take care of myself. Lived her life to see other people smiling. And my dad was a military guy. So he had process and discipline. And those two, and they both had tons of love. Sorry, man, I, I, it's been years. I still get emotional talking about them. Oh, yeah. um, they have been the best servant leaders I've ever seen in my life. Professionally, a um, guy by the name of Bob Hunter. He was my executive vice president of Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment when I was there. He was the guy who saw my drive and my behaviors and said, here's a retail guy who wants to open a soccer stadium. That doesn't make a lot of sense because um, he's never overseen a construction project, let alone a $68 million new soccer stadium in Toronto at the time. Um, but, I, but I do believe that he's the type that wants to learn. And if I teach him, he'll get it. And, and Bob was just a tremendous human being in my life. And even after I, I left him at MLSE because my next role was his and he wasn't going anywhere. And I took the opportunity to be VP of sales and marketing at the printing house. Bob was the guy that every two months we're having a beer at Jack Astor's and just catching up on work and family. So those would be, yeah, without getting back into mom and dad and getting emotional, Bob professionally and mom and dad, like that is, I'm glad you asked the question. I, and I'll try not to ramble. Some of our most positive leadership influences, if we look around, they're in our life and we just have to bring them into work. You know, when I talk about the trust piece of connection, well, when you're in a jam and you've got that friend that you go to that you can tell them anything, they're usually that person because they listen. And yet we decide as leaders, we need to talk and we need to talk all the time. But that core behavior of leadership is all around us if you look for it. And, and I didn't realize until my mom and dad were gone. It sucks because I wrote a dedication to both of them and my brother and they never read it. So anyways, sorry. <laughs> I was not, uh, yeah, great question. Sorry, Andrew. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody else got a question they'd like to ask? Okay, we're going to go once. You can put it in the chat. You can unmic. We're going to go twice. And I'm going to thank you all for being here today. I hope it added some value for you and there's a lot you can take away. Just keep being better and you're doing the world a service. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>